Hey folks, welcome to the Coastal Stoic. I'm Craig, here on the central east coast of Florida, coming to you today. Uh, gonna have a couple of different shots for this week's video, but I'm gonna start here. Um, welcome for those of you who are new, coming in, and for those uh, who have watched a couple of these, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And this is, this is a lot of fun. Uh, it's an interesting challenge, and so I'm thoroughly enjoying that. Today we're gonna talk about a couple of things, pay and dues, and you know what? It's okay to suck sometimes at things. When I was a teenager, 14, 15 years old, my idols, musically at least, were um, diverse. Uh, that what I, little intro I was just right, uh, playing right there when I started this was one of the first songs I ever learned on guitar just a long time ago. And I still pretty much suck at guitar, and I'm down with that. But when I was a high schooler, one of my influential bands, go figure, was uh, Van Halen back in the early, late 70s, early 80s. And there were days and nights that I would go to bed with my turntable on and my headphones slapped on my ears, volume cranked up, listening to Eddie Van Halen just destroy the guitar. And guiltily, I feel a little guilty for this, is I sat oftentimes in bed or lay in bed looking at the ceiling, the headphones on with my eyes closed. And I prayed that somehow that night I would be gifted, I would be granted the gift of being able to play the guitar like Eddie Van Halen. I will admit there was some fear. I thought to myself, well, hold on. If the world works that way, if I gain the power, does he lose the power? So I didn't want that to happen. It was just kind of warped, uh, young idiot uh, thinking. But I wanted so badly to play the guitar like Eddie Van Halen. And I, of course, nobody does or nobody has except for him. And my guitar playing ability is mediocre on a good day. But it was that mentality that I had at that time in my life where I just wanted the thing. I wanted the ability. I wanted the skill set. And the reality was I didn't put in the work. I was not privy to or allowed myself to think about how many hours and hours and days and bloody fingers and frustrated moments and broken strings and cussing and yelling and fear and whatnot that Eddie Van Halen must have gone through to gain the skill, the commitment, the passion, the overwhelming just desire to whether it be a star, just to be a master at his craft regardless it was and is still amazing, you know, rest his soul. However, what I want to talk about today is, is that idiot, Craig Bell, as a teenager thinking to himself, like, I just want the thing. And it wasn't until later in my life that I realized, and many people who were peers of mine realized it much sooner than I, but it wasn't for another five years, six years, that it really struck me that in order to be good at something, to be an expert at something, to be really talented at something, you have to work to get it. You have to put in the time. And that's kind of what this week's about. So enjoy the journey. And I hope you stick with me on this one. And my little outro of my little Buffett ditty. Um, but Buffett's another story for another day. Uh, thank you so much. And let's get on with the rest of the talk. I really want to harp for just a minute on this notion that it's okay to suck. It's okay to suck at things. It's okay to not be perfect on certain things. We tend as people in our culture and our society to like, we do something and we're like, oh my gosh, I gotta be good at it. I gotta be good at it now. I wanna be perfect at it. My students come to me all the time and they can write 
and they can read and they can think, but they're not, they're 15 years old. They're, they're not great at it yet. And they're developing that and they want to know why they aren't there. You know, why am I not Einstein? Well, you know, there's only one Einstein and that's okay. And we don't have to be him. Just like I was never going to be Eddie Van Halen and how selfish of me to want to have his skill, even though I didn't put in the time and the effort to be that. We see somebody pitching 100 miles an hour, a gymnast doing flips or springing off the um, the vault or something, and we're like, oh my gosh, I, why can't I do that? Why can't I do that now? I'll do. You know, let me try for a week or so, especially when we're younger, and we're like, I'll get it. But maybe, and if you put the time and the effort in, which is we'll get to in just a second, then sure, maybe that happens. But it's not an automatic thing. Buddy of mine, Brian, he uh, has a, actually I think he's retired now, but had a framing company, company. And I want to say framing company, not like picture frames like behind me here, but a framing company for homes. He would go into and frame out a house or build a house. He was amazing, uh, not only with his skill set. Uh, after Hurricane Charlie came through Punta Gorda, we lived over there for a while. And after Hurricane Charlie came through, everything was destroyed. It was horrific back in 2004 and I'll never forget Brian coming over to the house and helping and watching him run the saw up one of our roofing uh, pieces of plywood in a straight line without marking it and it was just a thing of beauty watching somebody so skilled put or utilize a power tool like that for me the line would have been all over the place I just am not good at that but he would talk about people beginning taking entry level jobs for his company and carrying lumber from the truck to the job site or bringing in sand or concrete or what have you for the job site, the tools, the batteries, the cords, the cables, whatever it was. And he would speak about these oftentimes young men coming onto the job site and being there for a month or maybe two. And when Brian would say, okay, guys, we need those two by fours from the truck over to the job site stacked up over here. He said, oftentimes they would question, but, but I've been here for like a couple of months, man. Why am I still doing this stuff? And uh, he would chuckle. He's like, because you don't know how to do anything else yet. Like, I'm going to teach you. We worked on this. And he would, he, I, I can't imagine or, or, or picture a better mentor than Brian. He was an amazing man with an amazing family. However, these young men would want to be better than they are without putting in the effort of doing that. He said oftentimes they would come and they would go because they realized that to get to the level of expertise was a process, was a lengthy process, was a lot of sweat equity. There was a lot of grunt labor that went into being able to do this well, because for him, the finished product spoke of him. It spoke of who he was, and he was not willing to sacrifice that for someone to do work that was beyond their skill set yet. So they would begin by cutting off or lengthening, cutting to length two by fours, which are easy before they would get to expensive and longer cuts on say ripping plywood or something of that nature. But he would lose a lot of people in the process of doing this because they weren't willing to put the effort in. And I find a lot of students, many, many, so many students are willing to work if you validate and you explain that, hey, you're not good enough yet, but that doesn't mean you won't be good enough. You're good enough for where you are right now, but to get to where you can write well at a college level or a professional level or to read well or to think openly and to question things well, we need to develop that skill set. And that takes me 
to where I learned that, Craig, you just are not good yet. And if you want to be good, that's on you, dude. That's on you putting the effort in and listening to the mentors that are out in the world and the mentors that you take and the mentors that help you, that help you to get better, listen to them. Because when they show up and they care and it matters, that's who you want to listen to. And they're wanting to do it to pass on their skills, to pass on their legacy, but also to make sure that somebody they care about is successful also. So I wonder what would have happened if I could have met Eddie Van Halen back in the day and been that person, but I think he would have seen in my eyes at that time in my life that I was not ready for that. All right, so let's talk about spearfishing. To continue the conversation about mentors and it's okay not to be good at something initially and to have somebody teach you I miss that as a young person, I, for multiple reasons, which will probably come to light as this channel evolves. However, the reality was I had. Um, I went through high school and then um, was not a stellar student in high school, and then went to the Army, and then out of the Army, I went to uh, a school here, it was actually in Jensen Beach, and from there, I got a job working on charter boats, um, scuba diving boats. We, they did uh, mostly day trips in West Palm Beach, and then we went to the Bahamas. And here's where I met, I would consider to be some of my amazing mentors. I have my aunt show and uncle Charles, who I knew for years and years, and uh, next week we'll be dealing with them, but uh, two are multiple fantastic mentors I had, and I'll call them like my out of family mentors, if you will. He I came to my life on these boats. Uh, there was Phil and Mark and Eric and TJ and others, but those four specifically were just um, instrumental in having me learn some valuable lessons. Um, they probably, uh, I don't know if they see it that way or not, or if they think about those times or whatnot. But one of the specific components that I was incredibly impressed with is in the diving industry, in the, in the recreational diving industry, there's not a lot of business in West Palm in the winter months because it gets cold and it gets windy. So people need to make money. So this crew back in the 80s turned to live aboard, or not live aboard, to, uh, live, turned to um, commercial spearfishing. And they were really good. And so the grouper would come in during that time frame and we would go out and I went, I began going with them. And I'll never forget watching them come up with all of these grouper, big grouper. And I finally let them convince them to let me go down with them. But back to what I talked about with Brian. For them, this was a business. They went down, they shot the fish, they tried not to destroy any of the fish because they were gonna sell the fish and make money to supplement the income that they were losing in the winter time. And I remember I went out, I got my, spent a, a, a lot of money for me at that time. I got my first, uh, uh, Spear gun is a 48 inch uh, biller and an extra shaft with a zip there. I set it up just like I saw them have it set up. So I had the equipment, looked just like theirs, except that mine was squeaky new and theirs was all beat up. And I finally convinced them to let me go. And the first person I ever went down with to uh, hunt these fish was Mark. And Mark was, uh, was amazing. He was like, a, he could, drive boats, like he could hunt fish, he was from Tennessee, he was he was just really um, quite the character. It is quite the character, I'm sure, still. But uh, I jump in the water with Mark, we're in about 90 feet of water, and he told me before we jumped in, he said, hey, you don't shoot anything until I tell you to. Now the setup was this, Mark had this 48 inch uh, spear gun, and he had a second spear shaft, attached it wasn't you couldn't shoot it you had to pull it off and reload 
never used a string. We never used strings on any of these uh, uh, spears. Uh, no power heads here, so there's no weapons like that. So it's just a spear and a gun. We jump in. The water's beautiful, cold, but nice. We jump right in on a, on a school of grouper, and these grouper kind of mull about. Mark goes down, he shoots one, shoots it in the head, stones it, the shaft goes straight through the grouper's head. The grouper is just spinning on its way down. In the meantime, he's he pulled out the second spear, loaded that up, put the bands on, shoots another fish. And by the way, if you are curious about spear fishing at all, go to Key West Waterman. That guy is beast. Um, Aaron Young, he's uh, from actually in this area, but he is amazing. I um, mean, he talks you through a lot of cool stuff. However, with Mark and I, we're down on these grouper and we're, he's, he's killed two now. He shoots the second one, same thing, right through the head. He goes to the bottom, picks up the first spear. These two grouper that he shot are dead. They're just lying on the ground. There's not much current. Um, he loads up the next ba the next spear, shoots. He has four fish that he has to go pick up that are dead. And finally, he points to me and says, go ahead. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? This is easy. Look at this guy. He just jumped in, shot four fish in the matter of maybe five minutes and has 100, over 100 pounds, because these were big fish, over 100 pounds of grouper here to sell. I'm like, I am all over this. I have my gun. I'm loaded up. I see the first fish. They're um, gray grouper, they're called, and, or gag grouper, I mean. Uh, I line up, I shoot, and apparently it's not that easy. I gut shot the fish. It's swimming off into a hole. I chase it into the two. I'm reaching in here. It takes me 15 minutes. By this, by the time I'm done pulling this fish out of the hole and getting it, and the meat is ruined, we have to. We can't sell it. Um, we do consume it, of course, but we can't sell it. Mark has another two or three fish on his stringer. He's looking at me, laughing his ass off, and I am so embarrassed i get back up to the boat i have my one gut shot fish that is worthless uh, uh, commercially and mark has his and um i'll never forget everybody bringing fish up except and i brought fish up but they were not usable i was bad and i thought this would be easy and phil i was going to the bahamas with him uh, the soon and his advice to me was get into the water with a Hawaiian sling in the Bahamas and snorkel and shoot for yellowtails. They're a little snapper. He didn't care how big they were. Shoot for yellowtails and try to get them at a distance. And they were small little fish. And I was like, oh, that's easy. So I jump into the place on a place called the Sugar Wreck. I must have chased yellowtail for days, kicking, holding my breath, shooting. I was in getting in great shape but I wasn't hitting the damn fish. It was as if they could, like, I was clearly not strong enough, I wasn't accurate enough, I wasn't all kinds of things enough, and I just sucked until one time after another, and he would critique, and he would tell me what I needed to do, and what I was doing incorrectly, and where I needed to aim, what I needed to, where I needed to locate myself, how I needed to stalk. He was telling me these things during this time, and finally, I was out there, and I remember shooting, this yellowtail snapper and being ecstatic it wasn't rather it wasn't very large but i had killed this snapper and then i killed another and it was as if i was weighed but it took so much work when i say work like a couple of two or three trips hours and hours and hours in the water i don't know how many times i pulled the bands back on this uh, hawaiian sling to try and i'll try to find a picture to put into this of a Hawaiian sling. It was just hilarious for them, but in the end, so rewarding for me. And then I got better with the spear gun with the other fish. And I got better when we came back to the States where we could use the spear guns. And I got better, but it took work. It took so much work until finally, I was never ever as good as they were, but I wasn't that much worse than they were but they had several years of experience above me. But when I realized how hard it was to do the thing that they were doing, it made it look so easy. When I realized how difficult it actually was and how much I wanted to be good at it, I was willing to put the effort 
to become an expert at the craft. And I became an expert. I was pretty good. Again, not as good as they, but they were years above me as far as having the experiences I've already stated. And I've taken that lesson. I was 20 years old, 21 maybe. I've taken that lesson for the past 37 years. Uh, yes, 30, I was almost at 40, 37 years and applied that. And as an educator, as students come into my class, I try to make it towards something that they want to achieve. I looked at my, my sons and I'm like, you have to want something to really work hard at it. And you might want something beyond the immediate thing you have to be good at. Say writing, for example. I don't like to write, some people might say. That's fine, but to be good at being an engineer or be good at being whatever it is you wish to do, you have to be good at writing too. So that skill has to be in your pocket. That being said, it's, I think this task of ours is to seek to make people see or want the thing that they want badly enough to work at it. And in doing that, we should not, in my humble opinion, make it to where the people who aren't good at something yet feel badly about it. So for example, I coach girls tennis. And if a girl comes out and she's not that good at it, if I tell her she's not good, that's not okay. I can tell her you aren't at the skill level that these other players are, but you have to, they've worked to get to that place. And if you're willing to work, I'm willing to help. That's the key to let a person know that it's okay not to be an expert at something that you're new at and to work at it and to realize that you may never ever, very few people are going to be as good as Rafael Nadal at tennis, as Djokovic, as Federer, as Serena, as Venus, as these other players are. Their drive, their passion and their physicality, their mentality, that's different than other people's. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you can't go out and enjoy and play the game of tennis. And I think it goes with so many things. So at the end of the day, what do we need to do? I think we need to not put somebody down for not being really good at something right off the bat. To encourage people to work hard at something to become better at it. To understand that maybe you work hard at certain things and you're never going to be that good at it. And if you enjoy it, that's okay. Craig Bell and guitar. I'm not that good at it, but I enjoy it, and it brings me joy to play. Will I play in a concert for a bunch of people? No, never. Although I did play a little riff in the beginning of this, and I'm not sure how many people will see that, but we should not discourage the people around us, and we should encourage those people who we are their mentors for. And if you are somebody who seeks or needs a mentor, find that person who's the expert and learn from them. Don't expect to walk into the space and be an expert immediately. It takes a village. We saw, we watched this, a documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I, Beth and I. And in the end, he made a comment that really stuck with me in that he says, people call me the, best, the, the, the quintessential self-made man. And he's like, I did not make myself. It was an army of people who helped me along the way. Mentors, friends, peers. So many people are part of that. And we need to let people know that they need to be part of those networks, those communities in the rhetorical world, these discourse communities that encourage people to be better. All right, that's what I have today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if you skipped around, which is fine, or if you didn't get to this point, okay. But if you did enjoy it, um, if you are enjoying it, please hit like and subscribe. It will be much appreciated. And if you feel so inclined, please leave a comment. I'll be happy to address those as well. Thank you very much for listening. See you soon.